Glenn. Hi, Mojers. Hi, Glenn. Hi, my name is Donna Clark. Welcome uh, everybody to this event on Zoom. I am on the board of the Wild Bird Trust and I am facilitating this talk with John this evening. I have the honor of doing that. Uh, I have been on the board of the Wild Bird Trust for just over three years. I grew up in North Vancouver in Lynn Valley and just off of Mount Seymour Parkway. So it's been wonderful to do the work on the board and um, give back to the community that I grew up in. The Wild Bird Trust itself is um, on the unceded ancestral lands of the Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish people and we are committed to actively incorporating Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish traditional knowledge into our conservation work, um, including compensation to Coast Salish knowledge keepers for the work. We are very grateful for the stewardship of the Tsleil-Waututh and Coast Salish people. Um, their caretaking of the lands and the waters since time immemorial. I am going to introduce you uh, very briefly to John Prasel, who's here this evening with us to talk about caretaking eagles. John is on the board. Uh oh, <laughs> a saw has just gone on outside my window. I think I'm going to shut my window. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, John is on the board of the Wild Bird Trust. And, John, I am hoping this evening that you will tell us, start off with telling us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Or quite a bit about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> How about just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank, thank you, Donna. You've been absolutely amazing and a real mentor of mine. Um, the Wild Bird Trust has been just amazing. I'm a, a new board director, just getting caught up. Um, and there is a lot to get caught up on. Uh, the directors and the members of the Wild Bird Trust at British Columbia have absolutely blown me away in my short time with them. Um, Glenn and myself here, uh, we go out there quite a bit in our Thursday night hiking groups and just the two of us, uh, Glenn's an amazing photographer. I see Sunny's here, hi Sunny, and uh, amazing photographer, wildlife photographer. But I mean, first and foremost, I, I would have to say I'm a photographer and uh, I've been a wildlife photographer um, and kind of uh, environmental photographer for about 20 years now. But my entire life I've been taking photos um, uh, my photos have been in all the major newspapers across Canada and the States, a few of them, uh, in England, uh, China, um, pretty well everywhere. I do a lot with uh, post media. Uh, I have done a lot with post media since 2008, starting with sports photography and ski racing. But, uh, my, uh, it's, it, that's where I kind of, I think people know me as a photographer first and a stream keeper. Um, stream keeper, I've been very lucky to grow up in Burnaby and uh, I got into stream keeping about two decades ago um, after taking photos and monitoring the eagles on Burnaby Mountain. We had a lot of development issues, uh, development issues in the, in the salmon creeks. Um, so that got me into stream keeping. I kind of just fell into it. Uh, it was a passion. At first I was just reporting for many years. And then I uh, started to be a steward of the creeks. Uh, Deer Lake Brook, uh, I looked after for quite a few years uh, with a few other people and quite a few of the uh, helping out with the stream keeping groups. Um, I'm more of an advocate now. Um, I still always in the creeks pretty well every day up here in the Sunshine Coast, Half Moon Bay Creek, uh, but mainly in Burnaby, Silver Creek, I looked after. Um, uh, family Ed Von Lowe looked after for many years before me. And his family looked after Silver Creek. I call Silver Creek uh, uh, the Forgotten Salmon Creek in Burnaby. And uh, it's literally a tiny little creek, but it's, uh, um, it used to have a ton of salmon in it. Still has cutthroat trout. It's only got a minimal amount of salmon in it now. But uh, living in Forest, uh, Forest Grove, Silver Creek is on either side of our property. 
uh, the complex that I uh, have lived in for uh, many, many years. And I help out, of course, the Stony Creek Environment Committee a little bit with the Burn Creek uh, group. They're an amazing group. And whoever else, uh, North Shore Wetlands Partners Society, I've helped them out a little bit. They've helped me out immensely. But yeah, photographer first, a stream keeper. Um, I do a lot of First Nations, uh, a lot of Indigenous tours now the last five years uh, with the local school boards. Uh, started with Newmanster Secondary School and uh, a good friend of mine, Daryl Nakashima. I do uh, tours all around uh, Burnaby, North Shore, uh, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, uh, Squamish Nation, up in uh, Chiam Nation, uh, Chehalis. Uh, we do eagle tours up there. Uh, but yeah, I'd say a photographer, streamkeeper, and uh, just a lover of the land and mountain. Uh, the last five, eight years have been a real uh, water and land protector, though, and I've uh, and that's where I met a lot of the people from. Uh, um, you know, up in the mountain the last since 2014, Trans Mountain doing all the work up there with the expansion project. But uh, um, yeah, and now we started off with just a few of us work uh, working the creeks up there. Uh, they got full on stream keeping groups, um, really amazing stream keeping groups. But Silver Creek was kind of forgotten. And uh, but now the last three or four years, we've got a ton of volunteers for Silver Creek and all the creeks and a community watchdog group that has really helped me out and uh, yeah it's been a lot of fun but uh, I'll, I can fill you in a little bit about uh, mainly what got me into eagles many yeah. many years ago when I was a kid um, my mom and dad I was very blessed to have an uh, amazing parents so they're still alive uh, mom's 85 years old a true elder uh, from Squamish and Lekamel Nation and uh, she is one very wise elder uh, still teaching Still, uh, um, still teaching at Langara College at 85 years old. Just bought a brand new car last year. Uh, does therapeutic touch, but and Dad's an amazing uh, man. He's been having some struggles the last two years with uh, uh, dementia. And uh, but they, we were brought up like I was so gifted to be brought up in the mountains all four seasons. Uh, we grew up hiking and ski racing and skiing and fishing and. Uh, rock climbing, did a lot of rock climbing when we were younger, but uh, we had a, a definite, we were taught by mom and dad and their friends how to look after the land and make sure that we respect the land. You would never, any of our friends when we grew up, there was, there was no littering whatsoever. Uh, that was just unheard of, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s and uh, since then. But uh, eagles, particularly when we were kids, we used to go to like the Lighthouse Park. And we'd go up to Squamish and... Uh, and I, I was just always blown away. Everybody was with the eagles. Um, as you, many of you know, uh, the older generation, we almost lost the eagles here on the coast, uh, uh, mainly due to DDT, you know, really bad uh, pesticide, very toxic, uh, but also lead shots that were, uh, you know, the small animals, uh, lead shots, which is still around a little bit. But uh, yeah, we have, uh, um, so the eagles, as you can see, have been a passion of mine since I was a kid. This photo in front of you here, I took about 10, 11 years ago. I was with my daughters out at Gary Point in uh, uh, Richmond. And sorry about that. Uh, Gary Point in Richmond. And that's a, a male uh, blackbird, red uh, blackbird on top of that eagle. The quality is not so good here in uh, Zoom land, unfortunately, when it went back and forth. But uh, I can assure you that photo is crisp <laughs> and uh, I was absolutely blown away. It's the only time I've ever seen that. Very rare to see that. So I thought I'd open up that with that photo there. Uh, we had about 35 seconds uh, and I had an old Sony camera that was an awesome camera. And uh, that blackbird hung on. That eagle was more than upset and uh, flew off for about 35, 40 seconds. And that blackbird was still hanging on. Uh, there might be another further away shot there, but uh, yeah, very cool. So what started out with the Eagles about 20 years ago on Burnaby Mountain specifically, and my interest was I was up there one winter um, and one of super cold, windy days in the middle of the winter, um, January, December, and even into February, the Eagles would, and they still do, every cold, windy day, it just has to be a windy day, uh, they ride the ridge. They come from Barnett Beach, and they do a loop. It takes them anywhere from three to four minutes 
and high speed loop. They come up the west side of the mountain, up the ridge where the velodrome trail is now, the 500 steps of thigh burning hell, I like to say, come up on the ridge. And it's one of the best places to shoot eagles in full action um, in the lower mainland. And you just go in behind the playground of the gods there and uh, you can get some amazing shots. They come right over your head, about 100 feet over your head, sometimes even really close. And there's usually 30 to 40 of them. So that had me very interested uh, way back when. So I got all sorts of cool shots and videos. And uh, that kind of got me hooked on the Eagles on Burnaby Mountain. I moved on to the mountain in two th late 2001 in Forest Grove area. And uh, a beautiful area, absolutely beautiful area. And I would hike up the mountain from the south side, uh, just above the tank farm and got to go to my secret little places. And then I got to act actually really monitor the eagles and watch their, I'd literally sit up there for five, six hours, sometimes all day, bring my lunch, coffee and uh, goodies. And uh, I'd watch the eagles and I'd actually monitor them and count their numbers, uh, see what they were eating, where exactly they were going with my uh, binoculars. And what I found out, it took me three or four years was they were specifically coming to the top of the tank farm, the Trans Mountain Tank Farm which has been there since 1953, 54, 55. And uh, the trees have regrown the second growth trees there. And they're absolutely beautiful perch trees there on the top of the tank farm. The eagles love to have a good view, as you know. Um, here we got an eagle's nest. I don't know if you'll be able to see, it's a little bright, but on the island there, we have an eagle's nest. It's a long way to go, you know, with this little camera. We got an eagle's nest over on the other side behind the trees. Uh, hopefully we get to see a couple here tonight. Um, but what I found out after three or four years was the eagles were specifically coming to that area when the fish were low. And there's not a lot of fish in that area in certain years, but they were coming for the ducks. Literally, they were coming to grab the ducks that flew from uh, Burnaby Lake into the wetlands at the bottom of the mountain and specifically a uh, little squint lake. And the ducks would come in, the eagles could see them. And I just watched there with my binoculars, my camera, as like I was the first couple of times, I was like, holy cow, I'd heard about them for years, obviously. But they'll take them right out of the sky. I got a picture coming up. It's not a very good picture. But uh, oh, here's a little friend in behind us here, a little uh, hummingbird. Um, but so when I started noticing that, how many ducks they were taking, out of there and how they actually caught them right out of midair, it actually just blew me away. And uh, um, so that's really what got me interested in the eagles on the south side of the mountain. I'd still hike up to the top and watch the eagles on the north side. Uh, a lot of the nests are up the Indian arm up near Belcara, Path and Admiralty Point. Um, all the eagles nests in the area, and there's actually not that many there. Um, they're all close to the water, obviously, with a good view. And, uh, but a lot of them come in from, uh, they're been on Delta, um, Sawasan, and, uh, and all over the lower mainland. But they had actually come, uh, those 30 or 40 of them, every day during the windy days, they come to Burnaby Mountain. And uh, they, they, actually, a lot of people don't know this, but eagles actually play. And I didn't believe that at first. You'd think they'll always be hunting or doing something, but they actually play. You'll see here in a bit, uh, we'll show some pictures in a bit of uh, eagles up in Seymour Mountain that are actually playing with sticks, dropping the sticks out of the sky. And I got some, the pictures are a little bit weak, they're a little far away. Um, I've seen ravens do that for the better part of 25, 30 years. You'll see that all the time, crows and ravens play with sticks. They'll actually drop sticks out of the sky. Another one will catch it. And uh, but some of the photos we'll see here in a bit. But uh, so specifically, We've had some really serious issues though on uh, Burnaby Mountain uh, with the Eagles. Uh, we have the Trans Mountain Corporation uh, expansion, unfortunately has really affected uh, the local Eagle population, not just the local Eagle population, the red tail hawks, uh, they took a nest down uh, inside. Uh, um, they had so much noise with the, the last couple of years there, the red tail hawks of course left. Um, over at Westridge Terminal, uh, already a couple of years ago, I did a story with uh, Peter McCartney from the Wilderness Committee. And uh, we did it with the Star newspaper at that time. And that was, uh, I remember going to see the Eagle's Nest in the Trans Mountain on their property and it had fell down. Somehow this Eagle's Nest had fell down 
um, Trans Mountain actually put a, um, they had some help and they put, a, unfortunately they put a cone um, over top of the eagle's nest. Um, they, they had studied it for, and I know the fellow uh, very well that has studied that, uh, and it was his job to study that uh, uh, eagle's nest, but they put a cone over the eagle's nest so they wouldn't uh, um, uh, nest there, you know, two years ago, unfortunately, with all the noise going on. Um, it actually somewhat worked out. They built two alternative nests, and uh, one of them has uh, taken up uh, that one of the alternative nests. Uh, we'll have to see when they're finished with this three or four year project, whether or not those eagles will go back to that, uh, uh, the nest and rebuild in that area. Um, the tree is still there, so hopefully they do when this is over, uh, but they've pretty well wiped out all the trees there. They took down about 300 trees in that direct area around that eagle's nest, and uh, just quite sad. Um, there's a couple of pictures here, the security guards all over us in the media uh, when we were doing that story. Um, this is a picture here of, uh, a lot of people didn't realize uh, two years ago, a little over two years ago now, almost two and a half years ago when the expansion project was just getting going, it actually wasn't named the expansion project. They were doing some modifications uh, and upgrading for the expansion project at the Trans Mountain Tank Farm. I literally live three minute walk away from this area here. Um, uh, I was up here uh, two and a half years ago almost and I came back and I knew exactly what Trans Mountain was doing. Uh, I've been working with the National Energy Board since 2013, uh, trying to stop Trans Mountain from burying the two uh, Eagle, uh, Eagle Creek and Silver Creek. And, uh, and I can assure you that uh, there's no other way to say it that pissed me off, pardon my French. Uh, the creek that I've been looking after for so many years, they, they have continued to actually, not continued, they have actually buried a large section, a long section of it, and Eagle Creek even worse. Um, but I've been working with the National, trying to work with the National Energy Board, the former National Energy Board, now the Canada Energy Regulator, and I've had some good successes. Uh, uh, some not so successful, but uh, it's almost next impossible to work with them. It got so bad they weren't answering my emails there about two and about two years ago. So I wrote Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the next day I got emails back and uh, ever since then, and uh, I can assure you I was pretty angry. But um, yeah, so what's happened up, unfortunately there, they knocked down uh, within an afternoon, 400 trees just above this area here where this picture is. And unfortunately about 30 of those Eagle perch trees uh, were knocked down. Uh, you'll see in a couple other pictures here, you'll see the size of these trees. A lot of people, most of them are second growth. You'll see right there. Uh, that's at the entrance. That's uh, Camp Cloud there. You can see the size of some of those trees. We lost cedars. We lost hemlock firs. We lost a lot of cottonwoods and poplars, poplars which you can see in the background in uh, the shell station there. But the sad part was those 400 trees were basically gone in a day or two. When I came back, I was like horrified. Um, so I made a couple complaints. Um, they kind of stopped for a little bit there. They put it on hold, a bunch of the work. Uh, since then, the last two and a half years, they've cut down over 3,500 trees on the tank farm. And, uh, and it's a mess up there. They basically clear cut the whole thing. They've left about 30 trees and, uh, and some pretty scrappy trees at that. But uh, that's where the eagles have lost all their perch trees on the top. There's still a few up there. There's a picture here coming up, uh, an eagle sitting on the top of a fir tree. And there's the mess that they made. Uh, this was, believe me, they didn't want any of these pictures in the media. And uh, cause you just had to walk around to Donna, you've been there, I know. And, yeah. uh, but it was just total destruction. So they would go and knock down three or 400 trees at a time. And uh, uh, the eagles, hawks, they didn't, they didn't care. It was just, uh, um, you know, they could have done a lot of different things. Uh, there was a lot of proposals with two less tanks that they didn't have to destroy the Salmon Creek, uh, rip all the trees out of the Salmon Creek, uh, specifically Eagle Creek, but they just went through. Uh, unless they're caught red-handed, um, they just keep going through. And I've been lucky enough to catch them red-handed dozens and dozens of times. We'd stop them. I've stopped them for uh, up to nine days of the work up there. Uh, I forced the National Energy Board about a year and a half ago. Uh, I decided finally that I had to get them at their own game. So I would catch them for infractions that were written in law. 
Um, and I was specifically worried about the salmon and eagles, of course. Uh, but when you see destruction like this, you'd think it's only a small little area. It's not a small little area. A lot of people don't realize how big the tank farm is and, uh, and how much damage they actually did. It's, a, it's basically just clear cut now and uh, totally illegal to do. Um, I talked to everybody from the Ministry of Environment. They got involved. Um, I got the National Energy Board. We did put a stop to some of the trees being cut down. Um, uh, they actually end up failing uh, uh, the first and only. They've had two since then that I forced the uh, uh, Trans Mountain and the National Energy Board to hold a full joint inspection. Uh, you can see this picture here where this were, these were in the early days here. Uh, it doesn't take long when they got these cutters here. I think I got a photo over here somewhere. Uh, they have these cutters that can mow those trees down, those large trees down in literally 30, 40 seconds. And uh, they move all these out of the way. They try to hide most of this stuff. They actually built berms and they'd hide a bunch of this stuff behind the berms. Immediately when they're cut down, they put all the trees in behind these berms. But I still got pictures and a lot of friends got photos. Um, but uh, yeah, so what we did was we went after Trans Mountain specifically at their own game. So we had to catch them in non-compliance. That was the only way we could stop them. And then, so I would take all sorts of photos. I got to know their, uh, those 157 conditions. I got to know the municipal bylaws. I got to know the provincial bylaws. That was quite an effort over the years. And so I would catch them with leaking gas cans. I would catch them with uh, uh, no hard hats. I would catch them with uh, very serious, uh, you know, generators literally in the creek, uh, overflowing in the creek, uh, no drip trays underneath uh, all their machines. And uh, so we actually shut them down in their first and only joint inspection. Now here's the tricky part, uh, the weird part was the National Trans Mountain knew for 11 days that they were gonna get an inspection. So they were warned after I went to the media and went to the Canada uh, Energy Regulator um, that they were gonna be inspected. And uh, I demanded, I actually demanded a, a full joint inspection where well, we had so much evidence that, uh, and I don't show it all the time. I always hold the best back for weeks later. And the Burnaby Now and the Vancouver Sun has been very good to me with those, uh, specifically the Burnaby Now. And uh, have, I, I don't even know where I'd be without uh, uh, the Burnaby Now over the last 15, 20 years helping me out with the Eagles and the stream keeping. But uh, yeah, so they had 11 days of notice, 11 and a half days of notice and they still failed miserably they failed that first joint inspection. Um, I tried to stop the last set of trees from coming down. Uh, that didn't work. Um, I'm still trying to stop that. Uh, some more trees from coming down. But uh, so yeah, you can see we have our hands full. And sorry, here's another picture of some of the bigger cottonwoods. Let me take a look here. And some of the size you can see have actually those ones. The logging trucks that went out, uh, they actually got really good money for uh, the cedar logs. Um, and the furs and the rest of it, they use they for basically for pulp um, and waste. Um, the poplars and the cottonwoods, they, they're not much money. Um, I asked uh, Trans Mountain if they donate uh, cedar uh, for me to strip and for the community, uh, they never answered me back on that one. A lot of people don't realize that, uh, I think I have a, you know, Trans Mountain, I forgive everybody, it's just the way I am. I, we had had another big pipeline, actually almost uh, 20 kilometers long that went through Burnaby Mountain, Burnaby, East Vancouver and Coquitlam in the last three and a half years. And that's the Fortis pipeline, the exact same size pipeline, 36 inch natural gas pipeline that uh, it was leaking in seven places on the mountain because the mountain was uh, sloughing off. Uh, that natural gas pipeline is about 50 years old, but working with Fortis was absolutely unbelievable. We got to go on meetings anytime I wanted to. They actually made changes when the community asked them for changes. Um, I, I brought young kids out from the environmental groups and stream keeping groups out for uh, uh, tours with uh, the managers. And these were not, uh, uh, you know, young student managers. These were their top environmental leads. We had, uh, um, you know, literally vice presidents from Fortis come out on these meetings with us. And I always make sure I bring a couple of young keen kids, you know, from high school on these tours. And I ask them to ask many questions and it's really cool. But Fortis is amazing to work with. Um, we had very minimal problems with them. Uh, like I said, they made lots of changes. Whereas Trans Mountain uh, was just a complete nightmare.
Uh, when Kinder Morgan bought out Trans Mountain way back in 2007, uh, when it was Trans Mountain, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, they were really good to work with. When Kinder Morgan came in, it was a complete nightmare. Uh, we had two spills, uh, not their fault, uh, the one. Uh, one was a city of contractor, Burnaby, uh, had a bad bad uh, spill accident there in Barnett, as a lot, a lot of people know. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how bad that spill was, though, as the whole area was closed off. Uh, and I can assure everybody, I was up in the mountain that day when a neighbor, I was up on my mountain bike in 2007 when that spill happened. I was about 10 minutes away uh, by bike. A uh, neighbor came up and says, we've got a bad spill, we've got a bad spill, John. I ran over there with my bike, rode over there as fast as I could. And I could already hear within about two minutes this high-pitched oil, gu oil gushing out of uh, that 36-inch uh, tank, uh, sorry, pipeline. I can assure you all, too, you never want to hear that sound. Uh, that actually frightened me. I jumped up on a roof uh, carport with the neighbor's uh, uh, a neighbor I didn't know at that time. He allowed me to jump up on his roof to get a few pictures. I still couldn't really get any pictures. There's about 30 of us there watching this uh, from over the ridge. And uh, I tell you, you know what? We all wanted to get out of there because there was men screaming, workers screaming, and just trying to shut this thing down. And uh, the RCMP finally came in and yelled at us all, and we got out of there quickly. And they just said, get the hell out of there. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there was 35 homes affected. A lot of people had to move out of their home in the Westridge community in 2007. Um, it took a long time to clean that up. All that crude went down all the, and it was dry summer, uh, it went down uh, all the uh, outflows through the ditches and uh, through the storms right into the Burrard Inlet. They boomed that up, but it, ruined all like Cass Creek was totally destroyed. It took them about two years to clean up Cass Creek. Cass Creek actually they had the only way they could clean up that little creek. It really hasn't been a salmon creek for many many years below the concrete plant there. But what had happened was um, the only way they could clean up was put in boiling hot water, truckloads and truckloads of boiling hot water. And then they collect it down below. They flushed it three times that little creek from up at Barnett Highway. And of course, the crude killed every living organism in that. And uh, there was birds, there was all sorts of stuff in that creek. And uh, it's a tiny little creek, but it's very steep there. It goes down to Barnett Beach. Um, they boomed that off, flushed it out three times because that's the only way they could clean it. Uh, salmon creeks and even little creeks like that have critical aquatic organisms uh, that a lot of stream keepers know about. There's 25 to 30 really critical ones of these ones. I do apologize, sorry, I gotta turn that phone off. Um, but uh, if you lose these aquatic bugs, um, if they get destroyed to toxins or a spill of whatever, um, they found out in, um, down the south, uh, you know, the Puget Sound stream keepers, they found out that they have, uh, they need these 25 or 30 bugs for salmon and cutthroat trout for the phytoplankton and everything. But they never quite got back after they did all this work on these creeks that were long lost 30, 40 years ago. They spent 10, 15 years cleaning these beautiful creeks up. And uh, some salmon came back, but a lot of salmon wouldn't come back because they're always missing five or six. They're always missing five or six of these, uh, um, sorry, five or six of these uh, critical aquatic bugs. Uh, so that happened literally in that whole area, Westridge Terminal. Now there's cutthroat trout in a couple of those little creeks down there. And, uh, but I tell you, there's 17 kilometers. A lot of people don't realize this. Those crews collected that crude oil from 17 kilometers of uh, shoreline around the Burrard Inlet in 2007. That was just a small spill that was literally only going for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, so yeah, but definitely worried about that. Uh, we lost, uh, they had to cut down quite a few of the big trees down there because they're affected by the oil, which nobody knew about. They're still testing. They test like once a year down there. And uh, sorry, I do apologize. Um, they, they test uh, um, once a year and they're still finding levels of crude oil in there, and, uh, which is really sad. But, uh, but back to uh, present day, I will tell you that, and I do apologize folks, I'm just trying to get this off here. Sorry, there we go, it's finally off. Um, present day, I'm, I'll be speaking on August the 8th uh, 
there's a day of action in the brunette watershed uh, just down from burnaby mountain and uh, trans mountain is cutting down a thousand more trees in the brunette watershed uh, that's our most abundant salmon creek in uh, Burnaby. It's part of the whole brunette entire watershed. That's what I spoke about. Uh, it's a nice picture there. Uh, I wow. spoke last week, um, but the brunette river, this is actually, sorry, this is up in Chehalis Nation, uh, Chehalis River. But uh, yeah, Trans Mountain, uh, by the end of September, before the rains come, they have been given the okay to cut down a thousand, a thousand trees in the brunette watershed. Uh, the eagles use a lot of those trees, I can assure you. We have what's called uh, the brunette watershed and uh, uh, we get salmon up there every year. We get hit and miss a few times, a lot of chum. We actually have a, a, a year round cutthroat that live in that creek. Um, you know, we get three different kinds of salmon in there. Uh, I've worked in that creek for many, many years, Stony Creek, uh, Eagle Creek, Silver Creek all lead into there. Not just that, but Still Creek leads into there. Uh, Renfrew Creek, we get fish as far away as up to Renfrew Creek uh, in East Vancouver. And uh, they come in from the Salish Sea, 27 kilometers up the Fraser River, all th three arms of the Fraser River. They come up 27 kilometers, uh, six kilometers up the Brunette River and into the Burnaby Lake watershed system. And uh, now we have some exciting news with uh, um, a bunch of the creeks coming back that they've been so clean for so many years. A bunch of the little creeks like Bona Vista Creek, uh, I've seen salmon in there. We've never dropped salmon in there, but we're starting to see a lot of salmon in those little creeks, which is really good. So hence why we have all these eagles coming back to the area. Um, and we've had quite a few eagles. Uh, Glenn and I here uh, have uh, kept track of uh, the Burnaby Lake eagles for quite a few years. Uh, they lost their nest about a year and a half, two years ago now, it was blown down the windstorm. Uh, they moved over to Deer Lake, uh, took over a red tail hawk's nest at, at Deer Lake, and uh, now they've moved back and built a new nest at Burnaby Lake, uh, you know, in the next season, which is really cool. So we're always on top of that. But uh, the stream keeping part of it, you bring the salmon back, you bring the herring back, the eagles will be there. Um, it's still really hit and miss. Uh, we've had a couple of bad years. We hardly seen any chum a couple of years ago, and that seems to be happening about every third or fourth year. Um, we don't get hardly anything in a lot of the creeks, like nothing in uh, you know, Buckingham Creek at Deer Lake. And that's where the eagles will go after those ducks. And, uh, and they, they've actually shifted um, their diet and they actually love the ducks. They eat seagulls up here. You see them take seagulls. Uh, I think I got some pictures here coming up of uh, uh, merganser ducklings, sadly, a couple of weeks ago here, right from here. Um, uh, the three eagles are attacking a merganser family. Uh, I'll just show you the view here from uh, Lori's beautiful home here, but I'm in Secret Cove here. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but we see the eagles and ducks, a just absolutely amazing place here. Uh, it's a little busier lately and then down in the cove here is very quiet down here. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. You see Lori's carved eagles here and uh, uh, it's absolutely a stunning place to watch eagles. I don't even have to get off the, the deck, which is really nice. Um, but I'm specifically concerned right now after monitoring the eagles and literally counting the eagles, um, seeing what they've eaten, what they are eating, uh, specifically in the bad salmon years, um, but one of the biggest issues we're going through right now is loss of habitat for the eagles. And uh, sort of a little dark here, sorry. And uh, is uh, the loss of habitat. And uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of it. Uh, it's not just Trans Mountain who are cutting down, you know, 5,000 trees just in Burnaby. Um, we're seeing all sorts of development issues on the lower part of the mountain below Forest Grove. Um, and a lot of these critical perch trees and critical habitat is just being lost to development. The city of Burnaby are strong partners of mine and, and all, all the stream keepers, they've done an amazing job. Uh, Mike Hurley, uh, the new mayor has, I've just blown away by him. Um, uh, I took him on a tour of the tank farm. I took him on a tour of a uh, sacred rock up in the mountain and uh, they've helped out immensely the last couple of years since Mike Hurley's in. They've always helped me out. And they've helped everybody out, but there has been a positive shift with mayor Mike Hurley. 
Um, and I can tell you the guy's in shape. <laughs> he's in he's in really good shape. I took him up for two and a half hours up in the mountain. Uh, Rita Wong was up there, gave us a beautiful smudge at the watch house. Um, but we're in the middle of protecting a sacred area. We're also in the middle of uh, trying to protect a bunch of the landing around the tank farm. Um, City of Burnaby is doing right now uh, a beautiful multi-use trail uh, on the side of uh, Burnaby Mountain Parkway. So we can actually ride up safely and stuff. Um, people can walk and it's quite a wide trail. Uh, it'll come all the way up from you know the west side of the mountain down at Hastings. Uh, they're doing pretty good work on it. Uh, it's come with some issues though. <laughs> They've taken down a few trees and uh, you know they have to take down some trees obviously, but uh, that's one of the biggest issues right now that I'm finding in and around Burnaby, not just Burnaby, up here in the coast, out in Delta. Delta, we're losing a ton of land, um, a ton of prime eagle habitat. Um, they're doing a really good job out there though. The, uh, the, the environmental groups and the, all the eagle lovers in Delta, and there's a lot of them are doing some really good work out there, stopping some uh, critical areas from being logged and developed. Um, I think I'll be asking a few of them for help in Burnaby uh, pretty soon and uh, possibly on the North Shore, but that's one of our biggest issues right now is just loss of habitat. You don't, yeah, 5,000 trees, um, that's a lot of trees and that's a lot of habitat. There's a lot of birds in there, uh, a lot of ducks in there, a lot of wetlands in there uh, along the brunette watershed in the bottom of the mountain and uh, that just drives the eagles away. They like peace and quiet for eagles for the most part. You'll see them all over Burnaby. You'll see them everywhere up high, but they really like to stay away from people for the most part. Uh, you'll always see them, they're everywhere. Um, but we keep losing these trees. Uh, we had a big loss in Richmond uh, six, seven months ago on the north arm of the Fraser River and the Richmond side near the Cranberry Farms. Uh, we had, uh, a, they cut down 300 plus trees there. They cut everything down. It was uh, with no notice whatsoever. Uh, City of Richmond apologized for that, uh, and that was critical eagle habitat, and right beside the river. And uh, so, yeah, we got our work cut out for us. Um, there's some amazing groups out there doing some incredible work. Uh, David Hancock and his crew are so far ahead of the game. Um, but one of the big issues we're again we're having anywhere from Squamish up here, up Chehalis, Glenn and I, and uh, a bunch of our friends been going up to. Chehalis Nation and all around the area for you know many many years now pretty well decades and we do uh, eagle tours up there and but again it's just loss of habitat um, when the fish are low the trees are being cut down it's the same old story unfortunately and the eagles pay the price um, I'm still hoping that we can protect that land up at Chehalis Nation um, you know there's golf developers want to get in there do more golf courses and uh stuff like that, uh, big developments up in that area that uh, you know, there's a core group of people that are fighting that. And a lot of people actually from Agassiz and stuff, uh, the city council up there doing a really good job there. They know what they have there and it brings in a ton of, uh, uh, it's really good for the economy, brings in a lot of money. Um, they've handled it quite well. On some days when they do the Eagle Festival up there, uh, there's literally thousands of people up there. The whole part of the valley up there really relies on all these, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 eagle watchers coming in every year, year in, year out. Uh, there's always challenges, of course, but uh, one of the biggest ones, of course, is loss of habitat. Not just loss of habitat, though. We have all sorts of other issues from our dump sites in uh, Delta. Many of us, I was talking about it today, um, you know, a large portion of the eagles from the lower mainland spend their time about 70% of them out at the Delta. Uh, Delta has been trying to do a good job out there, uh, but you see it all over Delta, you see plastic and the eagles are eating everything under the sun that they can't bury quick enough at the landfill site. The landfill, Delta landfill site is a massive site. Uh, they do a very good job of burying it pretty well right away, but if anybody, the photographers here know, I'm sure we've been out there many times you know, taking photos. Um, eagles are also attracted to, they got a methane uh, uh, producing, it's actually kind of cool, the uh, renewable uh, natural gas uh, thing they have out there. The sad part is that there's so much heat coming off that thing, the massive, very giant fans, that the eagles are actually attracted to that. And they'll sit there and ride the thermal in there, which is uh, really something uh, we should never see. 
but they're there. Glenn and I spend a lot of time. We get uh, down at the local cranberry farm in Burnaby. Uh, we see incredible wildlife down there. Uh, we've been allowed by the owners uh, to film there for many years. Uh, we have uh, Metro Vancouver has, a, um, there's no other way to say it. It's a massive garbage burning uh, factory really. <laughs> and uh, they burn a lot of our garbage there. A lot of people don't know about it. I'm not sure how large that stack is. It must be two, 300 feet high. I don't even know. It's been there for a long time, but it burns the garbage. Sadly, the eagles down there, the same thing. They ride the thermals in this garbage, which is and it's just sulfur dioxide and just all the garbage coming out there. And there'll be some days, 5, 10, 15 eagles, they ride that thermal. And it'll be a totally clear day and you'll see this thing go up. And then we sadly got all these pictures from you know, the eagles and they'll just ride that thing all day. They love the heat, especially on the non-windy days. Uh, eagles will use it to actually hunt in the area. So they can see all around, you know, the farms and the, the wetlands there. And they fly right into that dirty mess. It gets them up on the non-windy days. The windy days, they don't use it so much because they don't need to. Uh, they expend a lot of energy when they're hunting and uh, on non-windy days. And, uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of sad to see that. Uh, like I said, we've got far too many pictures, Glenn and myself, of that and videos. But uh, yeah, there's some extreme challenges uh, that some we wouldn't, I didn't even know about two years ago with eagles and uh, um, some of the ones that the trees cut down years ago when I first started with uh, had a problem with the Trans Mountain besides burying those two beautiful salmon creeks um, was in 2014 when they Trans Mountain uh, did the boreholes on the west side of the mountain um, they did two big boreholes and there was about a hundred arrests and uh, it was quite something up there the one day they came over with helicopters on these uh, long lines and bringing toilets and porta johnnies and drilling equipment and uh, you name it over right over top of all the, the beautiful protesters the RCMP and every the media and so I, I they scared all the eagles away we have a critical it's a beautiful perch tree it was actually at one time there was a nest there and it's just above the velodrome trail on the Barnett trail and uh, uh, sorry on the uh, Pandora trail and you'll see eagles there all the time. And the eagles were there. This helicopter kept in and out, scaring the eagles away. They finally took off. So I filmed the whole thing the entire day from up at the restaurant or the, above the playground of the gods and filmed the helicopters coming in over top of us. So I immediately got home when I got home, sent those photos to the media. And I also contacted uh, the National Energy Board at the time and uh, Transport Canada was. Well, they stopped immediately that day. But I made a complaint. Uh, I think there's some photos here, uh, the emails. Uh, made quite a few complaints to the National Energy Board. They actually end up stopping those uh, helicopter uh, tours. They only could do them in the morning. Uh, and they stayed away from the Eagles for the most part after that. Uh, but they really, until they get caught, they don't really crap. They don't really give a crap, unfortunately. But uh, it's so good to see now all these Eagle groups and these Hawk groups out there. Uh, they've been around forever, but they've been... Uh, we've got a hawk group in Burnaby, and I'm not even sure, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're an amazing group. We see them down at Burnaby Lake on the freeway trail, and lots of hawks, as you know, along the freeway, because they can get the moles and the mice and uh, all the little ones that are on the side in the open, And uh, but they've actually been doing a, a lot of good. Um, Glenn and I have been involved the last few years with uh, the airport YVR. They have a relocation program. Uh, for all the raptors out at the YVR to keep the eagles, and mainly the hawks, away from the airport. It's an incredibly busy airport, as we all know. And it, it's been going on for like 20 years. But the relocation uh, program itself, I think, has been going on for seven, eight years. It's actually been very successful. And then every once in a while, Glenn and I'll find, I've seen a Burnley Mountain, a red-tailed hawk that was released like four years ago, uh, captured at the YVR airport. They sent it out to Agassiz, and it came back to Burnaby Mountain. Um, uh, so there's a lot of intervention. Quite often it doesn't work, uh, you know, human intervention, but quite often it actually does work. And, uh, you know, we've seen what, uh, you know, bird strikes can do to planes uh, you know, back east in New York uh, and other places. But uh, there is no lack of raptors and hawks and eagles out at the airport, I can assure you. But uh, there's a new fellow in charge of that. and They're doing an amazing job and they do it. Uh, humanely as possible when they catch these raptors and the eagles and release them a long ways away. Quite often, so they tag them, of course, when they come back. So 
if you ever see one, any of you photographers, if you ever see one of these ones, uh, contact me or, uh, you know, Glenn and, uh, We'll, we'll get you into the YVR group and uh, very interesting. And you'll find out the story. Some of these hawks will come back year after year. Some they don't see for a long time. And, uh, the eagles, but they're very neat. We had a cool story up here about a month and a half ago. We had a sharp shinned hawk that ran into a, not a great story, but it turned out good. Ran into a window down here of one of our neighbors in Half Moon Bay. It was a young sharp shinned hawk. And uh, the neighbors went out there and they phoned up the local uh, rescue crew. They came out immediately from Seashell, drove up and uh, got this hawk. It went back into Owl, this little tiny sharp chinned hawk, and, uh, juvenile, about a year old, I guess. And uh, then I was here and I got some really cool video and uh, photos when it was released. Owl looked after it for the better part of a month and a half. And uh, it was, and it's still doing well. So I see it about once a week hangs out the feeders because it gets all the little birds down the road but uh good success stories with a lot of good groups uh um burnaby wildlife rescue association is doing some amazing work of course owl um glenn and i ran into a guy uh, about a year ago at the eagle's nest on burnaby mountain he was flying by or sorry burnaby lake he was flying by and uh, we got some really cool photos glenn got some amazing photos of this little helicopter I said, wow that guy's kind of low but he ended up, he was bringing, he, he donates his helicopter and his time. And he brings in wildlife from all over Vancouver Island in this area and brings it into Burnaby, into the Wildlife Rescue Association. He doesn't like media. And we were trying to get a little media going, Glenn and I, with them. And he doesn't like any media. He just does it for the love of, uh, you know, the animals. And uh, and he was bringing in an eagle or something that day. Tiny little helicopter, this little private helicopter. But, yeah, lots of good people all over the coast doing some really incredible work. But yeah, next week, uh, we've got some, next couple of months, we've got some interesting times on Burnaby Mountain with some large developments down on the bottom of the hill, um, the bottom of the mountain. Um, the city of Burnaby has, like I said, done a really good job. They are listening uh, and they're actually doing some really good changes. Uh, I like to introduce myself to the developers before they start and that as a stream keeper, I don't give my stream keeping card. I just, you know, very nice. How you doing? You know, you know there's a Salmon Creek here. I give my uh, environmental photography card and, uh, and it seems to work quite well out, uh, quite well now. Uh, the last four or five years, it just seems like I was putting out fires though. Not enough time in the creeks and, uh, and mainly unfortunately with Trans Mountain, just putting out fires and uh, doing media stories and helping other groups with media stories. And, uh, and it takes a village for sure to protect these eagles, not just the eagles, but the hawks and the salmon, the year round cutthroat trout that live in all these creeks along the coast. Uh, um, but you can always tell it's a healthy neighborhood if there's eagles there. If you get eagles there all the time, it's kind of like the canary of the coal mine with eagles. Um, now, mind you, they will eat a lot of really bad stuff, and, uh, super unhealthy for them. But uh, it's really cool to see one of the big reasons they're coming back so much in the Burrard Inlet area is the Squamish Stream Keeping Group started that herring, uh, started redoing the herring nets and all along the Creosote Post and False Creek, all up in Squamish, all up in uh, Indian Arm and uh, Way of Wichin, uh, to say with Tooth Nation, Squamish Nation. And they started like seven, eight years ago, even before then. So now we've got these herring coming back. And I would never thought that a group of 35 people could actually make such an impact. Like uh, uh, I was blown away to see the herring already five years ago in False Creek in Vancouver. And how many herring, I see them out here all the time. I get to paddle in the herring pretty well every night, every day. And it's something else if you've never paddled over uh, a school of herring, literally the size of two or three football fields. Uh, we don't see them that big so often, but last year I was out in a, in a, a little tube Half Moon Bay, and literally the best I could see, I got video and stuff. I was literally in a float tube for the first time, and uh, a, literally a herring ball, probably the size of three or four football fields that I could see. Um, so with that in Vancouver and Burrard Inlet, that's where we're seeing all the whales back here. The cetaceans, I've got pictures five years ago, dolls porpoises at Whale Witch and uh, to say with Youth Nation, Kate's Park. Uh, we've got uh, Pacific white-sided dolphins. We've got, look at the orcas that have been back for four or five years. Uh, we had a humpback whale underneath the Second Narrows Bridge. 
uh, absolutely amazing. But that's because the herring and the anchovies, a lot of people don't know that the anchovies are uh, doing very well again. Um, unfortunately, the waters are warming up a couple degrees, like just a smidge. And, uh, and I think that's what's bringing in a lot of these. Somebody caught a mackerel over in Vancouver Island, big mackerel, warm water fish. We're starting to see a lot more of the molas and the sunfish way up, you know, Queen Charlotte's and Haida Gwaii, um, sorry, Haida Gwaii. And, uh, but we're starting to see a lot of these fish, mackerel are starting to go way up north because of uh, the warmer temperatures and climate change. But uh, really good news in Burrard Inlet. I'm so proud of uh, partnering with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Squamish Nation, which is my ancestry, and Lekamel Nation. But uh, Musqueam, everybody's been doing an amazing job, uh, doing the best they can to protect those lands that they've looked after for time and memorial. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, uh, with a lot of the stream keeping groups. They've taught me so much. I learn every day. Um, we're, I'm right in the middle of, it's taken me two months this tiny little Half Moon Bay Creek here, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, has got this really cool little camera. So I'm actually right from the source, right to the mouth, um, I'm documenting that creek. And it's been really cool. So you've seen anybody, my Facebook friends have seen me in the water quite a bit lately, safely. We don't go in anywhere near the water where the salmon are down below in the salmon channel, stuff like that. But I've got underwater, hopefully that'll be out in a month or two, which is really cool. And I'm almost finished. I think I'll finish it next week. And, uh, but we're, Pacific, Pacific Salmon Foundation is documenting all these creeks and they've only done 30 or 40 now, but they'll do another 30, 40 this year. And every year uh, they'll get more money for these cool little cameras. And so the stream keepers are documenting these creeks and it's really helpful for school children, for ourselves. Um, we can actually see, we did a bug count. I did my first bug count in uh, Half Moon Bay Creek about three weeks ago. And it was pretty impressed, tiny little creek, but they, you know, they get like 20, 25 fish every year. It's had nothing but development problems, not development problems, sorry, logging in the old days up until about the 90s. Uh, so a lot of the logs, all the scales came off, all the bark came off, and uh, it was just a mud pit for the you know, better part of 50 years. And uh, the salmon somehow are coming back, which is really a gift to see, and because uh, otherwise it's a perfectly clean creek. And, uh, but yeah, it's really cool. The Pacific Salmon Foundation has been doing some incredible work. Uh, and when they do work for the salmon, that also work for the eagles, which a lot of people don't realize. We're all connected. Um, sorry, oh yeah, sorry, I thought that was a picture. It's Rob Alexander, it's a cool picture of a coyote there. That was one of mine. Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that, that when Trans Mountain already two years ago on the mountain, um, when they knocked down all the first set of trees, uh, they knocked down six, 700 trees, plus the 400. Uh, they took a coyote den out. And they didn't even know that they took the coyote den out. They had no idea. I got two pictures here, coyotes here. Uh, Val's has them there, I'm not sure. I'm right in the tank farm and uh, there's no more coyotes there now. And they just stay away from the tank farm. It's such a mess up there. Um, but uh, yeah, we, like I said, we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, we've got an amazing group in around Burnaby, Vancouver, lots of help from, uh, um, I've really noticed too, lots of help from the provincial government has helped me out immensely. And that's a shift. Uh, the last four or five years, the uh, uh, environment ministry, uh, I actually get emails back from the environment ministry and George Heyman. That would never happen in previous years, but they've been really helpful with some of the issues that we've been dealing with in Burnaby specifically, but not just Burnaby everywhere. Uh, so yeah, it's, it seems more, uh, lack of a better word, there's more conscious people out there who are concerned about, they're concerned about the, you know, the wildlife, the salmon. Um, I call it the sacred salmon, of course, because it's the lifeblood of the coast for First Nations, uh, not just First Nations, Indigenous people, uh, and not just Indigenous people. Everybody loves salmon. Everybody loves the orcas. Uh, there's some pictures here that I have. I'm not sure if you can pull those up, uh, Alice, of the orcas. Uh, I have quite a, I see them right out here in Half Moon Bay. I've been so lucky. Last time I seen them was about six, seven weeks ago. Um, uh, but we see them, I think, seven, eight times last year. Now, I'm always glassing the water. Always. And then i got two friends, so we always have. We can always have big binoculars, and so we get to see quite a bit. But uh, it's, it's actually a real gift when you're out there. I don't believe in whale watching tours whatsoever. Uh, we still have to be very careful out in the kayaks. Uh, I spent 70 days in the water last year out here and at home. 
and it's a long time. It's a lot of time to get in the water. So I'm very grateful and thankful to see a lot of this stuff and a lot of these things, but I always keep a distance. Always, always, always. I got a big camera, um, never get close. I got, I got in, uh, in between some Pacific white sided dolphins, uh, a small pot about 40, uh, five, seven months ago here in Half Moon Bay. And, uh, and it's my job to get the heck out of there. And they passed by me three times. I just stopped. And then when they went past the third time, I just got out of there. I don't like to get anywhere near Pacific white sided dolphins when they're feeding. And, uh, but you stay away from them. Uh, one of the critical things that we're having, obviously, everybody knows about the Chinook salmon and the effect that it has. A lot of people don't realize on the eagles, but uh, the Chinook salmon, the fishery is just in really rough shape. Uh, I'm on the Ocean Protection Plan Committee the last two and a half years for the federal government. Um, that's been an eye opener, I, I can assure you. Um, the noise coming off those ships. Uh, we had last year our winter forum a year ago down in Vancouver with 270 of us on the South Coast Committee. There's uh, groups from lots of, you know, there's indigenous groups, there's uh, um, there's cruise industry uh, reps, there's uh, tow, towing companies, uh, barge companies, ship companies, everybody's involved. Uh, I gotta say it's a really open uh, uh, committee. I was shocked actually, this, and, you know, a lot of people say, you know, the, Ocean Protection Plan, uh, Trudeau put in $1.5 billion, basically, you know, people said to shove this Trans Mountain Pipeline right through. Oh, we'll, we'll look after all the whales, we'll look after everything. Uh, last year, the Winter Forum, they had their uh, hydrophone crew that looks after all the whales, specifically for the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline. There's going to be, uh, if that expansion goes through, which it looks like it is going through, uh, hopefully not, um, there's going to be 800 additional trips to and from through Juan de Fuqua Strait into Burnaby. So a lot of people, they say, oh, there's only 400. Yeah, there's 400 in, 400 out. And uh, that hydrophone crew was there all day from 8 in the morning till 4.30 last year at the Winter Forum. So I hung out with that crew. I sat near them. I changed my seats. And we have designated seating. I decided to sit by them. You know, we couldn't hear those whales. There was so much noise from all those ships going by pleasure crafts it's the big ships that are the problem though and uh, even with these new propellers um, you couldn't even tell which uh, orca group it was uh, the crew there worked and they phoned uh, one of the biologists one of the whale biologists in uh, Saanich and he could barely he phoned back about an hour later and he said exactly what uh, you know the J pot or whoever it was at that time but uh, yeah we got our work cut out for us um, and that's the shipping lanes, it's a 10% increase in Vancouver shipping lanes with the Trans Mountain expansion. A lot of people don't realize that. Almost 11% increase with those 800 trips uh, into Burnaby, right through the most critical habitat for the southern resident killer whales. Not just the southern resident killer whales, but the transient bigs too as well spend a lot of time down there. And, uh, it's the feeding ground that has been for thousands of years for these beautiful uh, southern residents. and. Uh, Yorkas, and, uh, and there we are with 70 whales left, maybe 72, 73 whales left, and uh, not really a whale, they're actually a dolphin, but uh, yeah, it's it's sad, I tell you, um, when we see that whale watching trips and all the beautiful eagles down the Saanich area, um, I, I've had many arguments with uh, friends, and I just let it be, I said, and people about the whale watching trips. I highly recommend you don't go on any whale watching trips. There's a lot of land-based places in Saanich and the peninsula that incredible places to watch whales from land or you know from your binoculars on a lot of beautiful places. But uh, I've actually seen 40 boats in the water uh, basically chasing down a southern resident of Orcas about three years ago. I was in White Rock off the water in White Rock we were about five miles off there about five years ago and again 20 something whale watching boats uh, on the border in White Rock and you can see and the, the whales they don't even know what to do you know they're just trying to get away from these boats even with these 400 meter 200 meter thing I can see in the next 10 years that uh, I'm hoping that we don't have these whale watching boats uh, we're gonna we're literally loving these beautiful uh, orcas to death not just the orcas, all the other whales out there, the Pacific white-sided dolphins, everything else. Uh, a lot of the, um, it brings in an insane amount of money, which is a lot of people good for the local economy. Um, uh, but you know what? It's, it comes at a cost. And, uh, 
there are some incredible places, incredible places right here, Thormanby Island, Texada Island, where you can see the whales from the cliffs. And uh, you see, starting to see some tours. You'll see a lot more down in Saanich, which is really cool. And, uh, but yeah, it's the only thing, one thing I recommend people, yeah, watch those, stay away, please, from those uh, uh, whale watching boats. Uh, some of them are very respectful, and, uh, but it's, it's not doing the whales any good, that's for sure. Um, back to the eagles, um, we have, uh, I don't know if anybody's been out, uh, you know, obviously Squamish and Brackendale is really good. Um, Chehalis Nation, you get up to Harrison area, Agassiz, uh, Little Chehalis River and mudflats out there, Rowena's, they allow you to go on the golf course. You can see it material anytime, you have to be respectful. Um, go out there, it's absolutely amazing. I like going to Delta. Delta, because of the landfill, it kind of... Sometimes it turns me off when I see all that plastic and all the trees all around the airport area and everything else. Uh, eagles are always majestic. They need our help. Um, they actually have a, uh, they're going to be making some changes out in Delta, which is really cool. Uh, the landfill is constantly trying to be a better partner out there. And, uh, but they also do eagle tours at the, a few times a year. They do six or eight eagle tours at the landfill, which is good. Metro Vancouver. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd much rather go to, uh, you know, out in the wild, a little bit different than that. I like going to Squamish or Chehalis Nation or just up Burnaby Mountain. It's an absolutely beautiful place. Eh? So here's a picture over Burnaby Mountain uh, with the Eagles uh, uh, playing, just literally playing in the wind. And uh, uh, they weren't even courting at this time. But uh, yeah, you get above anywhere on Burnaby Mountain and you'll see there's always 12 to 15 eagles on Burnaby Mountain, always. Uh, they come in in June. Um, and I, hey, Sonny, how you doing there? And uh, thank you. Um, a little far away, this one here. Uh, my computer's at home, by the way. This is just my laptop. Also, my work, my big photos are at home, my computer. I didn't realize I'd be up here for two and a half months, but it's an amazing place to be, that's for sure. Um, Burnaby Mountain always has 12 to 15 to, you know, 18 eagles. Always, uh, you'll see them. And uh, windy days, they'll be on either side of the mountain, uh, quite often up near the restaurant, the playground of the gods. But uh, most often, they're always on the south side because the winds mainly come in from, you know, the river. And uh, they'll play up there for hours on end. Uh, I think I got a photo of here, a couple of photos of their wing touching. And then I got some cording and uh, their talons locking and upside down. Glenn and I have been very lucky uh, in Burnaby this last year to get some amazing really cool shots and uh, just witnessing some of these uh, eagles falling to the ground at speed with their talons locked up is uh, a lot of people have never seen that and, uh, to capture it is just absolutely amazing I still got to get some nice clear clear shots but uh, but it's absolutely a wonderful thing to see and uh, we're lucky to see it all over Burnaby uh, a lot of you people in North Vancouver know all about eagles uh, Vancouver again everywhere Langley, all the way up the coast, uh, we're seeing a lot more eagles, which is really cool. Uh, up in the valley, uh, there's some really good protected lands. Uh, uh, lots of plenty of ducks, that's for sure. But here's a picture of an eagle up at Seymour Mountain, uh, dropping a stick and catching it. And there's uh, four or five here. It's the first and only time I've actually captured. Uh, it's, I'm quite a long ways away with a small camera. But it was quite amazing. I had my good friend uh, with me, and uh, there's, there's a series of seven or eight of them. And that stick actually dropped about 100 feet, and that eagle caught it every time. And then they pass it between each other. Um, I highly recommend anybody. Ravens do this all the time. They literally do it all the time. They get sticks, and they play it back and forth. Uh, if anybody's ever hiked up Mount Tom in Chilliwack, Mount Tom, highly put it on your bucket list. You get up there in about an hour. It's a nice medium hike and it's got an amazing viewpoint up top and the ravens are up there every day especially on the windy days and you'll see them tossing sticks rocks everything back and forth to each other and a lot of people don't realize that they they never knew that ravens and eagles do this they actually do it it's really cool when you can witness something like that and they're not hunting they're not looking for food they're absolutely just playing and uh, they actually do that a lot of people argue with me i've spent a lot of time watching eagles and uh, mainly ravens do this but it's quite something if you can capture that and, uh, and to actually witness that and watch that is really neat so thank you Alice for that 
This is over Deer Lake in Burnaby. These are pretty washed out in Zoom land here, um, but uh, they're actually, I got a whole series of these almost directly over the west side of the lake last year sometime. And uh, the eagles were actually courting and playing here and uh, you know, finding mates. And uh, they fall to the ground when they're like this at up to speeds of about 100, 120 miles an hour sometimes, as fast as a human and quite often faster. And uh, right before they hit the ground, they break off literally. And sometimes you, you'll hear about them, they'll hit the ground. I've never seen one any hit the ground. But there was some pictures in, uh, I think Vancouver is awesome this year. There was some, I can't remember where it was. And a couple of eagles got tangled up and they, they hit the ground. And, uh, one was badly injured. But uh, yeah, to witness this again too, to see these majestic raptors, uh, just absolutely amazing to see that. And you see, it's a pretty good size in that one there. Might be a few others here, which is really cool. But, uh, yeah, if anybody ever has, uh, just you know, hit me up on Facebook, um, Instagram. I don't do a lot of my eagle shots on there. A few, but face, Facebook, you'll see a lot of my website. Doesn't really have any eagle shots. My website's not very good. But uh, if you ever need any help with, uh, you know, with media or any any issues with the eagles, uh, send me an email and can help out or send the right person or send the right organization to help out uh, a lot of eagle lovers out there and it's definitely our job to you know look after you know definitely look after all these people or these eagles and, uh, yeah it's kind of, kind of cool too these are amazing uh, and this is over burnaby mountain i believe this one here and um yeah we're like i said we're losing clarity with zoom landing back here but uh yeah very nice uh, uh like i said burn me out almost anywhere in burning me mountain you can see all these eagles but the best place to go really in the really windy days just go right up to playground of the gods uh, horizons restaurant there and park yourself anywhere up there uh, near the ridge and you'll see all sorts of eagles uh, they come in from belcara there's quite a few nests down there uh, i don't even think anybody knows how many nests are up in the Indian area but it's pretty, uh, you know, the you know, boaters go out there, but it's really quiet out there. The eagles love it up there. So we watch them come in from Barnett on the top of Burnaby Mountain and Admiralty Point. I spent a lot of time out there the last 10 or 12 years. Belcara, you can sit out in the rock there for hours on end and you can see the eagles fly from literally all the way up Indian Arm. They come and there's a nest at Admiralty Point, well hidden nest. They go over to Barnett Beach, up and over the mountain, and they go to the Burnaby Lake and the Fraser River and Delta after that. And they can do that in no time. And we watch them from Burnaby Mountain come in, and they, as far as you can see with the binoculars. And most of them are coming from the Fraser River and the Delta area, so often. They come right in back and over Burnaby. And, uh, they'll hang out Burnaby uh, if the thermals are good. They'll hang out the south side of that mountain for quite a long time. And, uh, Quite often, a lot of them back home in uh, that area. Uh, they come, of course, when a lot of you know um, the salmon. As soon as the you know salmon come, the eagles come down from up north. They spend up north, uh, you know, late October, uh, and they will come back in November. There's just masses of eagles come back into town, into Van City. I mean, the lower mainland. And, uh, they take off again early May, end of April go up north, up the central coast, up here. Still a lot of eagles here in the summer. It's amazing. The Sunshine Coast, not very far away. It's only about an hour, not even an hour from Burnaby from uh, where you know, they can fly up here. But a lot of them go to northern Vancouver Island and uh, hang out northern Vancouver Island and all the way up the central coast. Some of the eagles, uh, uh, talking to an eagle researcher with the David Hancock Foundation, and, and uh, but only a small percentage of them go up to Alaska, he was saying. And I thought there would be quite a few more that go up, but... Uh, they got such good fishing up in the Heltzik River, or sorry, Heltzik Nation, the Central Coast, and uh, all up the coast. It's pretty neat. And uh, yeah, thank you, Glenn. Much appreciated, bud. Oh, yeah, you're up at Whistler. Have a good time. Thank you very much. Glenn actually helped me for hours today on his holidays up at Whistler to get my, uh, I had a computer breakdown today, and I'd really like to thank Glenn. He did an amazing job. Uh, I owe him big time for getting my computer running today remotely. And uh, he's quite a photographer so it's been seeing a lot of his uh, uh work uh we, we found the mandarin duck a couple times this year refound the mandarin duck trevor the mandarin duck and glenn nicknamed uh very funny story 
Uh, Andrew Duck, and uh, oh, good, I like that. Uh, Rob Alexander, I love your uh, love your photo there. Uh, but we found I can't remember it was in December or January. We nobody had seen the man Duck for quite a while. And uh, hey, Rob, and Rob's a good buddy too. He's uh, been a real mentor of mine and taught me a lot. Rob Alexander teaches me a lot. The Mandarin Ducks yeah. lost all its plumage. It looks like crap right now. <laughs> I noticed those pictures the other day. Yes. I think it's been hiding. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the one tough duck, I can assure you. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, good to have you on board here, Rob. Thank you very much for all of your help. You've been an immense help to me. I've learned so much from you. Uh, Thanks, Sean. Thanks. And, and thank you to you. I've learned so much. And I'm very happy that you have this show today. Uh, and I'm you, learning a lot, so way to go. Remember, uh, Rob and I went up to Brackendale by ourselves uh, four or five years ago. We had two of uh, my ski racing friends and his high school friends got us together, knew we'd get along. We went up to Brackendale, and I always tell everybody the story with Rob Alexander. He walks in the woods so quietly, he knows everything, every little, um, everything. It's unbelievable. Every grass, every mushroom, everything. He's a, a self-taught naturalist. But we were specifically kind of shooting eagles that day, and salmon were up in the behind the Inch Creek of Hatchery. I can't remember what it's called. And uh, he walks like nobody else I've ever had in the forest walk with me. He walks incredibly quiet, like my uncle walking up. I felt quite a hunter and fisherman. Uh, incredibly quiet. We don't talk. We rarely talk when we're up there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rob. It's been much appreciated. Back to our, our funny duck, our uh, Mandarin <laughs> duck, who's actually thanks, you know, invasive. Thanks, buddy. Invasive species, uh, this Trevor the Mandarin duck. So Glenn got this amazing photo. He just got this. We had about 30 seconds with this duck, right? Dear Lick, we just walked up. Whoa. And I yelled out, Peking duck, Peking duck. And he's looking at me and I, well, something like that. And I said, Mandarin duck, Mandarin, just shoot. So we, we got some really cool shots, both of us. Looked at his shot. We both have these Sony cameras. Glenn's an amazing photographer. I said, okay, you got to send that into the Burnaby now. He goes, you think so? Oh, maybe. I said, no, you got to send that into the media, Burnaby now. Well, yeah, maybe, he says. I go, oh, we got Neil on board here. Hang on a sec. Oh, come this way. Sorry, I get a little excited still after all these years. Flying low here. Hang on a sec. We'll come around. We got a heron too. Got a heron nest right up here. And, uh, Sorry, we stopped for eagles. We break for eagles. Um, we had, uh, so we got to see this duck and it went crazy. Nobody had seen the duck for, I don't know, five, seven months or whatever it was. I had Glenn's photos just took off. They went viral. And I think we have a few photos here of the, pop, the paparazzi with all the, the birders. But we had a talk before. I said, this is going to go crazy, man. This is going to go crazy. It's probably it's a pretty good place for burgers to come down. And then we decided to let it go and do it. And it went bananas. We had like 40, 50 photographers down the middle of the winter, down the boardwalk. The city of Burnaby had to put up signs and uh, put up signs, you know, for runners and that. And all these photographers were there for really about two months. And then I spotted it again, got some good photos at Burnaby Lake. And uh, that's when I met Paul Dixon. At Paul was Paul's an amazing photographer, wildlife photographer. Met him over there, got some good photos. And again, the media storm hit, but it's a beautiful looking duck. I got to say that uh, Mandarin duck and uh, uh, it's over at Burnley Lake. You can see it pretty well anytime. Unfortunately, sadly, there's people feeding uh, ducks and uh, that duck over there, but uh, we haven't seen it at, at Deer Lake in a long time. But it is a beautiful duck. It was one tough duck. It's always scrapping. And uh, something like Rob said that duck is. Uh, Looking a little rough now, but uh, still beautiful duck, and which is quite something. But uh, sorry, I should I didn't see if any of these. Yeah, sorry, I I I've just seen the the chat here. Sorry, I'm gonna go really quickly here. Oh yeah, love it. Thank you, Tannis. I I do really get excited when I see eagles, and I see them every day here. I'm very fortunate and grateful. And uh, my beautiful girlfriend here, her place. It's called the Bird's Nest. This place here, you can see why. You can, I've seen evening grosbeaks beaks here for the first time in my life about a month ago. A whole bunch of them. Cedar wax wings are everywhere here. Um, we've got uh, the herons, of course, right here. 
Uh, oh, the other day I, I was trying to get on Zoom. I missed a Zoom meeting on uh, uh, with, the, with the Wild Bird Trust. I just couldn't get it together here. And the Western Tanager girlfriend spotted. She goes, I don't know what kind of bird this is, but it's pretty cool. And it's only the second one I've seen in my life. And uh, so I'll pop those pictures up soon. They're on my big camera. And this flying all around here was really cool. Uh, so yeah, uh, Lori rented this place out for five years before she moved into it. Uh, she lived right next door here and uh, airbnb this place and it was called the bird's nest. And it's, it's called the bird's nest for good reason. And a lot of birders have stayed up here and you can see we got uh, pretty well everything up here, which is really neat. I never realized until I came to this property just a few months ago, how many birds are up here. I see him in Half Moon Bay all the time for the last three years, and I've been coming to the coast since 1974. But it literally is Burger's Paradise. And, uh, anybody send me an email, I can send you to all the hot spots, literally up and down the coast. Sergeant Bay is a really cool place. Uh, Half Moon Bay, you can just go up the pier there. It's just absolutely something else. Um, but uh, Cooper's Green, all up and down the beaches, and just full of birds and eagles of course you'll see everywhere eh? and uh, you know let me just double check here John, yeah lower fraser valley yeah oh the fraser valley there was an earlier one that leanne had about um where do the eagles go when they're displaced where do the eagles go when they're gone well a lot of them will a lot of them will depending on where they are like one's uh so Transmount, for instance, they built, uh, David, the David Hancock Foundation builds these uh, alternative nests. Um, Rob knows all about them. They have one in McKay Creek, I believe, or is that the Osprey Nest? They have one over uh, uh, that they've used over in Vancouver. Um, and they're, I'm, I got mixed feelings about them, but sometimes they have to do it. Uh, they definitely have to do it. It's a little dark here, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the metal nests, uh, at least as far as I know, have not been uh, used at all by birds, uh, the pole nests. Yeah, they, they have, uh, yeah, they've got, they've made some up kind of half and a half with Wood Trans Mountain has done it. And they've actually, they're actually in there right now, uh, which is quite okay. something, been in there. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an iffy one, but a lot of these ones, when they're, when they're displaced, they're really screwed. They really get screwed. Oh, yeah. And, uh, if they're like a nest blows down, those if it's late in the season, uh, they will try to go over and take over somebody else's another even another eagle's nest, or specifically they'll take a like a red tail hawk's nest, build on an osprey nests. They'll take over any nest if they're desperate. If it's early in the season, uh, the eagles will rebuild right away. And uh, last year at Burnaby Lake and Deer Lake, we actually got to see them build a nest, which is a really incredible experience. And they built it quickly and they'll build on it every year. But they, it was so late when it blew down two years ago that they, they just left and I'm not sure where they went. We don't know. And uh, they were gone. And, uh, but the next year they came back and built it again. But uh, they, sorry, they went to, uh, two of them went to Deer Lake and took over that nest. And uh, George Clulo, a lot of you may know George Clulo is a good friend of mine and, and a real mentor. Boy, if you ever want to learn something, he's like Rob Alexander and George is absolutely amazing. Uh, he's uh, incredible to go on a tour with. Um, and Rob and him, they can hear the birds. They know exactly what they are. I can do with a lot of them, but uh, not, not like those guys. They've been doing it for decades and decades. It's really cool. I'm at the point in my life now, I'm 58 years old, that I, sh I should have done this many, many years ago because now I, I learn like seven or eight new species, but, but I forget 10 or 12 of the ones that I know. And uh, I joke about that, but I do forget about some of them. But uh, uh, one of my favorite birds too that we see like a lot here, cedar wax wings. The Western tanager is literally most one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen. Um, and it was quite big the other day. I'll get a picture up on Facebook. And Size of a robin. Yeah, I, I had not because wow. I've only seen the couple. It was really amazing. Um, when we get a lot of birds too, oh, the eagles love that. I can assure you they uh, they love that. And uh, But there's no lack of resources. In a place like this here, there's no lack of food. Like there's, there's enough Beautiful. For, there's yeah. enough for enough for everybody here we've got the cove down here the fish come in every day it's not a super healthy cove by the way but the fish the seals are down there every day and so we get the osprey and the eagles are always over top of that bay right there within the cove which is really cool and uh 
But again, you get a lot of the boats at this time of year and uh, a lot of the boats and um, some of them are not very well aware. And boats can be a lot of times, they're a lot quieter than they were in the old days. You know, a lot of sailboats up here. But the cool thing about boating people, they're very respectful. They really are, um, you know, for the most part, which is really good. And I really like to see that. Uh, but yeah, Donna, when these eagles, a lot of times we never know where they go, but they go take over somebody else's nest because um, they really have to have, and then God knows where they go. But uh, I've seen a lot of eagles fight, a lot of eagles fighting, and they, it is something to see. I got a lot of photos. I think I got a couple of photos here of uh, um, eagles, it's like literally scrapping. And uh, the juveniles will come in when they're five years old and they will attack. Oh, I do. I have a set here somewhere, possibly Alice. You might be able to pop up one or two. Uh, that was uh, maybe in the fourth or fifth email. And those were published in the Vancouver Sun uh, five years ago. Good friend, Lori and Mandy, you were there. And uh, it was absolutely amazing to see a juvenile eagle getting very aggressive with a, a bald, trying to take over you know, the mate. And uh, the, the juvenile was incredibly aggressive. And uh, I remember, and uh, but the bald eagle went out and uh, I remember when Larry Pinn, Larry Pinn's a friend of mine from the Vancouver Sun, the reporter, special stories and environmental guy for many years. And, uh, oh, he loved those photos. He just was blown away by those photos. And, uh, but when the Eagles fight, I tell you, it is, it's messy. And uh, boy, I've seen blood. I've seen, you name it, I have feathers flying. Uh, hopefully these were just came off from, you know, the other day from friendly, but uh, yeah, when they fight, it is something to see. Rob's seen it many times, Glenn's seen it many times, and uh, it is quite something. Uh, but yeah, fascinating to see the eagles up in the air all the time. And uh, like I said, but any good windy day, anywhere you are, uh, that's when you can see the eagles. Uh, anywhere in the waterfront, anywhere near the lakes, uh, the creeks, uh, even you know more of the big rivers and the Fraser River, a uh, really good place. Uh, um, during eagle season, you get down to Fraser Foreshore Park, uh, you get down to Gary Point, uh, anywhere, it's pretty good. When there's ducks and, uh, ducks and salmon there, they, they're, you're going to have eagles there for sure. But yeah, it's, uh, let me just read a couple of these here. Sorry, I, I only noticed them a bit ago yeah. in the chat. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, no problems. I'll say, uh, Just reading them really quickly. Lower Fraser Valley, yeah, there are all sorts of really good areas. Uh, Tanis, and uh, thank you again for everybody for being here on a beautiful summer evening. It's like, wow, it's it's amazing and much appreciated. I'm honored to the, that you guys are here. Um, Lower Fraser Valley is really good. Um, anywhere, uh, the golf course is hard to believe. Out in Surrey are absolutely unbelievable. Um, the Fraser River, uh, uh, Derby, what's a, what's a Derby Reach? Fraser River in Langley is an amazing place to go during Eagle season, just down on the beach there. Um, South Surrey, almost anywhere over South Surrey is really cool, White Rock. Uh, specifically the Serpentine River, you can get down the Serpentine Nicola River, uh, it's a really good area. Uh, you'll also see ospreys down there, and the ospreys and the eagles always go at it. And uh, it's quite something. Got a few hummers here now, which is good. Um, uh, another area in Surrey, uh, uh, Fraser River down to uh, Barnston Island's got, got a really cool nest right in the side of the highway. Uh, it's had two, uh, quite a bit older. It's been there for about 10, 15 years, 12, 15 years. Now you take a bike around there, take the ferry across. It's about three quarters way through on the far side. It's got a beautiful nest, perfect for shooting with the regular camera because it's quite low, that nest on the side of the road. And you can just pull over with your bikes there, or even car there. It's a really cool area. Very active there. Uh, White Rock's got a bunch of nests there, which is really, really, really cool. Um, Abbotsford, uh, I can't remember the park in Abbotsford. I was there a while back. Uh, I'll think of the name. It's underneath the bridge uh, that goes to Mission. Uh, it's quite a cool area during Eagle season. Uh, one of the best areas uh, is my mom's hometown, uh, Lecamel Nation, is uh, uh, the Slough in uh, Deroche anywhere up there you pull over anywhere on the side of the road 
just go for a little walk down the water in the Fraser, the slough, tons of eagles there. And uh, it's a very cool place if you don't want to drive all the way to Harrison, just go up to DeRoche. It's only 10 minutes past Mission. And uh, there is an amazing amount of eagles all over that area. And uh, yeah, just walk along the dikes there is really cool. Um, one of the good at Pitt River are the Alouette dikes are just in Pitt Meadows there. Anywhere along there is absolutely somebody. And there's not a lot of people out there uh, during eagle season. Uh, during the summer there is, but during eagle season, you get there in November, October, you know, the end of October. Beautiful area there and beautiful walking trails there. Um, Deer Lake is a pretty good place if you're up in the ridge. Uh, you don't see the amount of eagles that you see in other places, but there's always eagles there. Uh, Fraser Foreshore Park, like I mentioned earlier, is really neat. Um, uh, Delta is literally one of the best places to go to, though. Um, anywhere down near 72nd Avenue, uh, Delta. They have a dog park there, which I always kind of um, kind of bewildered me when I found out there's a dog park there in the middle of that beautiful eagle area, but uh, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eagles. And you just park there and you can just stand in the middle of the road and you'll get more shots than you'll ever. They fly right over your head 20, 30 feet. I just scared that hummingbird, sorry about that. And, uh, but yeah, some beautiful areas there. Um, down along uh, Westminster Highway, uh, I'm not sure, is that nest still there on Westminster Highway, Mandy? It is, yeah, it is. I haven't been down there a while. There's a nest off the side of Westminster Highway. It's been there for years and years. Haven't been there for a long time, but it's really cool. Uh, you go to the P and E now. They got eagles there, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, uh, Barnett Beach. You go to Barnett Beach or Admiralty Point. Bell Care is awesome. Really cool places. Uh, it'd be quite quiet there during uh, Barnett Beach during the off season. The, uh, you know, summer is busy. But uh, no lack of eagles down there, which is really cool too. And uh, yeah, but uh, you guys have got any more questions about? Uh, let me just double check here. About a couple minutes to eight. Yeah. Oh yeah, sunny. Yes, for sure. Boundary Bay and North Forty Park. That's where I was talking about. With that, is absolutely. It really is probably the most spectacular place to see eagles. And I like to see them when they're in the farm fields, a little bit more natural areas, not just the farm fields, but those trees down, down along the side of the road there on 72nd, and uh, which is really neat. I kind of stay away from the, uh, like I said, the, the dump site there now and uh, waste site, but uh, still a beautiful place. And if you can get into, you can't go into the Burns Bog, can't even get into the side. I did a bunch of work with the Vancouver Sun with the deer about five years ago with Larry Pinn um, with the deer originally, but uh, the eagles in Burns Bog are absolutely amazing because a lot of ducks in there. And the eagles come over you know, two minutes away from the Delta area and they come into Burns Bog and it's quite something to see them hunt those eagles or the ducks. And it's a beautiful area. Unfortunately, you can't get in there. I did a sad story I found out, I was watching uh, five, six years ago. And I go out there at night, I drive out there at night into 72nd Avenue on the other side, uh, near the perimeter road, Fraser Perimeter Road. And they had just built it and I noticed there's a few dead deer there. It was really sad. And I went, oh, no. and they had planted this grass on the side of the highway there near 80th Avenue. And then as I went out there and there was just deer after deer that had been run over. And then uh, I did a story with the Vancouver Sun and we did a freedom of access to information and uh, there were 71 deer killed uh, in that area in, a, in 18 months from roadkill because the Fraser, uh, the provincial government uh, were warned before that highway was built that they're going right through the bog and that they needed to uh, build a deer fence there. They did a deer fence on the other side, but they didn't do it there. 71 deer were run over uh, in the first 18 months when the Fraser Perimeter Highway opened up. Immediately they built a fence and that was really good. I was so thankful for Larry Pinn for that one. I ended up getting a, an anonymous email from a friend back then that uh, right from the provincial government that told the whole story that they just wanted to basically cheap out on this fence that literally cost hardly anything. And But yeah, we lost a better part of uh, 56 deer right there the Burns Bog and 15 on the other side of the Fraser Highway there and uh or sorry uh, uh on the other side of uh between highway number one and uh the Newport Man Bridge 
um, yeah, that was a devastating story. And it was devastating to see that, but we did a lot of good there. And uh, I always said the power of one. My mom always had us read the power of one when we were kids. You ever read that in our kids? We were in our 20s at that time. And uh, but I always tell everybody you can make a huge difference. It's uh, amazing what one person can do. And then, but when you have it, it literally takes a community uh, like the Wildbird Trust of BC. I'm just blown away by, I can't even keep up with all this, the cool stuff that the Wildbird Trust is doing. And, um, amazing. And just protecting these lands, protecting these critters and wildlife. There's so many groups. We have a long ways to go with our, uh, a couple of years ago, I did a story with the Vancouver Sun and uh, I pretty well wrote the story about we need better protection. We've got all these laws that we think we have here with the Wildlife Act. We think this is a really strong act. And what am I doing this last summer and this last spring? I'm writing open letters to you know Mr. Heyman to try to stop construction in Burnaby directly like 15 feet directly underneath the heron colony with 170 and they're doing some major work there and there was nothing literally that anybody could do i just embarrassed them so they've kind of stopped for now and but literally the george Heyman, the minister of environment couldn't do anything from this work crew doing work literally 15 feet underneath you know the biggest uh rookery uh heron rookery in uh in burnaby and so we still have to fight these battles and uh I shouldn't have to go to the media. We should never have to go to the media to do this kind of stuff, but we still are, unfortunately. That should always be a last resort. An eagle, uh, uh, a fish biologist told me about six years ago, really cool fish biologist. And she told me at the time, said that, you know, we just go to the media now, John. We, we have no time to beat around the bush and do all this stuff. So we just go to the media now. And uh, I understand her a lot more now. I remember, I think it was Otto Lang told me the exact same thing. Fish biologist, he retired EFO. A lot of you may know Otto Lang, a great guy. For many years, for about 10, 15 years, I could not find a fish biologist that would help me with my problems in Burnaby because they're all, you know, hired by the government. They're all on grants. And so everybody was, and they still are afraid to speak out. And so it was like next impossible to find a fish biologist that way. They had to be retired. They had to be totally independent. They had to be very uh successful and they all spoke to me privately and sent you emails but i was never allowed to because they would never get hired by you know whoever it may be with these provincial grants and city grants and everything and uh i hope that changes a lot uh, it has actually changed i work with some very good uh, biologists now uh, mike pearson is amazing has taught me so much one that uh, really found out and tracked the sailor sucker and the nooksack dates fish in the brunette river and the few in the nooksack river and the uh, this is a fish that's really only in five or six creeks, you know, in the world. And uh, they're going fast and you know, far between. They only live in riffles, uh, little riffles of uh, fast moving water. Uh, but Nooksack Dace Fish, yeah, check that out. Google that one up and uh, you'll see some really cool work by our local biologist, Mike Pearson out of Agassiz. Um, it's become a little bit easier now as I'm more, I do a lot more media the last 10 years. And then, but I should never have to, you should never have to scare anybody that you're going to go to the media if they're going to ruin something it should just be you know, you know we got all these laws here that we think are good and the city uh, i i basically went to i hate to say it but i went to battle with the developer in eagle creek uh, silver creek sorry for three years it just went on and on they ruined that creek like you wouldn't believe and uh, finally the city of burnaby came in they gave them uh, seven fines and uh, Equals like 1600 bucks or something. This massive development, a multi million dollar environmentally friendly. And uh, uh, it was just blew me away. Called the East Lake, uh, East Lake, the Down East Lake, East Lake uh, campus. And they just destroyed this creek over and over, oh, Salmon Creek, over and over and over. I must have done 12 or 15 articles and then both newspapers and the Sun and the Burnaby Now, and uh, they got a slap on the wrist. Uh, a lot of these developers now, they're getting pretty uh, wise. And what they do is they'll go give donations to salmon groups before they give a big donation and uh, however big and uh, try to appease. Uh, um, you know, we're just going to see what this is over here. It's like a, have a king. Well, this, might, this might be a nice way to uh, wind down sure, um, yes. for this evening. Um, there's a couple things here. First of all, I want to say 
Thank you so much. Welcome. You are, you've got so much knowledge and so much heart. You care so deeply about the eagles and the whole ecosystem around them that sustains them. And it's inspiring and heartwarming. And I know you to be a exceptionally positive person. Um, and there's a lot of hard things that you have faced with um, caretaking eagles and the salmon and the streams. Um, and you, 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 you go forward in a positive way, nonetheless, and I appreciate that as well. We're so lucky to have had you here. I'm so glad we did. We're gonna have to have you again. You're an incredible storyteller. I was riveted. I was never falling asleep at all. I was like hanging off, off of your every word because, there, and I took all kinds of notes here. Nice. <laughs> um, nice. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm just gonna say one thing here. And then there is one question um, that Sunny has, but before we, maybe close with Sonny's question, uh, John. I just want to say to everybody, um, really appreciate you here this evening on Zoom on this beautiful summer night. Um, uh, you as well, um, any donation, any humble donation um, to our organization makes uh, possible events like this and goes um, to conservation work for, for birds and other animals, uh, but mainly birds. <laughs> so um, I wanted to thank you and, and let you know there is a way you can make a difference with, with a contribution if you can. Um, now, Sunny has a question here, and let's maybe make it the last one, John. And we're just going to have to have you back. That's all there is to it. Oh, I'd be honored to be back. Thank yeah. you. Oh, much. thank you. We're so honored to have you. Now, um, what's a good location to see red tailed hawks from a close distance? Sunny would like to know. Ooh, Sunny, we'll have to go out when I get back into town. Uh, a really good area is the south side of Burnaby Mountain. But one of the best areas is uh, uh, literally the freeway trail at Burnaby Lake. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, the south side of Deer Lake as well. Um, we see a lot of red tail hawks. Um, at Upper Deer Lake, we call it the Ridge. And it's one of our favorite places. We, uh, we see a lot there right above Deer Lake. You're up in the ridge. You can see all the way from Bowen Island, all the way, all the North Shore Mountains. And uh, you're just above the lake, uh, barely 150 feet. But you can see all the way, all the way to Golden Ears. And there is a lot of red tail hawks there. Uh, and then we have another secret place. We actually have a secret place that, uh, that anybody wants. Uh, we'll we'll take them for okay. tours. I do small small tours, and uh, it's a it's a very cool place. My Facebook friends may know where that is, and then but anybody sends me an email, I'll be happy to take them out onto a a really cool area in the middle of the city where there's a lot of hawks, and uh, and it's a very neat little area. But maybe sunny, we can though, arrange that maybe. Yeah. For that sure. to the wild bird trust yeah we could definitely do that and we'll physically distance and uh yeah between our lenses it'll be great we'll be like six feet yeah <laughs> we have uh yeah a lot of good places uh south side of burnaby lake on the freeway trail sunny is amazing place uh close by and then i'll send you uh, some messages sunny uh uh and a couple other places uh, that you can get really close up to them and, and respectfully i uh, one of the big things I haven't mentioned, by the way, and it's probably a good place to close off, I always respect, always uh, respect the animals. Uh, always use your zoom lenses. Uh, I've learned some hard lessons over the last few years, uh, quite a few years ago. Um, but we have to make sure we respect uh, you know, the eagles and everything out there. Um, so use our big lenses. Uh, ethical shooting now is just the only way to go. A couple of years ago, there was a young photographer, I won't even say where, and it found he made had these amazing shots of uh, these owls feeding and it ended up that he was baiting them. 
and uh and horrible they, uh, caught up it was really really bad news and uh, and yeah, he was a very young guy and yeah, we, of course we forgive everybody right you have to and uh but yeah it, it, so you have to be really really careful when we're shooting uh with bears with anything i've been doing this for a long long time and everybody wants that close shot but you know with the lenses now we can do it respectfully and uh we can uh make sure we don't intrude on anything uh i always all my tours that i do with the high school students and uh, teachers and everything it's the first thing i actually teach them is uh we do this respectfully uh we don't walk in certain areas of the creek uh, uh we don't paddle in the middle of the dolphins out here uh, but uh, yeah and that, that's a that's the biggest uh there's a lesson tonight with uh for us photographers is respectful shooting and uh for sure. Donna, thank you very much. Much thank appreciated. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, John. Wonderful. Thank eh? And everybody. thanks to everybody who uh, came this evening here and yeah. your questions and just your presence. You know, it makes a difference. Yeah. Being thanks, Donna. Talking about this. Thank you all. Good evening. And if, Rest yeah. Thanks, John. Talk to you soon. Bye, John. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. Bye.